Turn back the clock 30 years. An elementary school teacher, fresh to the profession in rural Virginia, invents a board game for his students. He wants to push them to invent, to collaborate, to create, and to lead way beyond what traditional curricula can accomplish. And the game he makes is stunningly complex, calling upon them to resolve military, political, economic, and ecological problems way past what any reasonable observer would think a nine-year-old was capable of. But his students succeed, year in, year out. So much so that the man and his methods 30 years later become the subject of an award-winning documentary and he gives one of the most celebrated TED Talks in history. His name is John Hunter and the game is the World Peace Game. Now John may be an elementary school teacher from a simple rural town, that's sometimes how he refers to himself, but he has an extraordinary pedagogy founded upon relationships a keen understanding of how human beings behave and how groups function, and reflective insights and practical wisdom into how any teacher anywhere can become better at what they do. I just want to ask, when, when you think about how to get students to take risks and to step forward. How do you do that? Hmm. For students to take risk and to step forward. You know, I, I think uh, it goes to what, what, uh, what everything goes to in my class. And the, the fundamental thing is, of course, the relationship between the teacher and the student. Mm -hmm. And if I have that, if that's in place and it really is uh, full of caring for each other, understanding each other, or finding out more about each other, you have a basis to, to build anything on, really. And I think with that kind of relationship, you can build a trust. And you can allow the students to know that the environment is safe enough, that they can take a risk without penalty. And we take the moral sting out of, of the possibility of failure. Failure is just a larger part of life. Success is there. Failure is there. So we sort of take that sting that could be a, a, a guilt feeling or a personal value feeling out of not measuring up to our hopes at the moment. And when they feel that they can freely try anything without penalty, uh, they're much more emboldened to try any and everything to, to achieve any kind of goal or success we want to seek. And so I think that relationship of, and safety that you create in that relationship makes, the, makes it much more open for people to do things like that. Do you have a particular wrap that you give to your classes in the beginning <laughs> of the year? <laughs> any examples? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, you know, when we're playing the World Peace Game, I always start off with an apology, actually. And I apologize to them because of the state of the world that we adults have uh, left to them. And it's really kind of a sad, very sincere apology. And I think they, they very somberly and, and accept it that way. But generally, we talk about, uh, I'm here for you. I'm here to serve you. We're partners in learning. Uh, you know, you sort of lay the groundwork for the relationship to be seen as a peer, as a collaborative, as, a, as almost kind of an equal relationship in learning, so that there's not a separation. Uh, I happen to be taller and have been here longer, but they're wise, very small people, and uh, wise in their own unique ways. And so to honor and respect that initially is what I try to say at the beginning, that I respect you being here, that you have uh, special skills and talents and knowledge I don't have. And together we can maybe put all this, to, all this together and come up with something totally unique for all of us. I, I think a lot of work in the classroom is about how you build that culture. And mm -hmm. um, it sounds like you spent a lot of time, at least in the beginning of the game, but probably throughout crafting the culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and it's uh, n not so much words, it's more of a feeling and by action. You know, you show the students when they ask you a question, can I do this or can I do that or is this right? And you reflect it back on them as my mother did when she was my fourth grade teacher. What do you think? Uh, what's your view on that situation? How do you feel about it? And that's the immediate first response they get from you then they're, I think, in their minds thinking, well, this person is curious about what I'm thinking about and what I feel and what I'm interested in. So maybe we do have somebody who cares what I think and maybe what I think is valuable in this room. And so that kind of, uh, I guess, questioning or even just the feeling of the sincerity, I mean, it can't be an act, you know. One has to actually feel 
genuine care for the students. And if we don't, you know, we're in the wrong profession, I think. So that uh, if it's a, something natural or something that can be um, developed in a person, that puts them far into the relationship, far into building relationships, because you really do care. And you ask and leave a space where students can then come up with what they care about, what they think, and what they feel, rather than imposing you know, a structure from without that they must accept. So that, again, that openness and, and asking questions and leaving the answers up to them or unknown for the time being seems to work for me. John, will you tell us just a little bit about the beginnings of the World Peace Game? Um, how did you invent it and, and where did that idea or inspiration or even the freedom that you gave yourself to do it, where did that come from? Yeah, it's interesting you say the freedom that I gave myself, you know, because that's really a large part of what it was. I was offered that freedom by my first uh, supervisor, Anna Aero, and I asked her what should I do at, at the end of my job interview and of course she said, what do you want to do, which completely upset me because I was hoping she would tell me what to do, <laughs> so I know what to do and I'd be safe and secure in that. But she didn't. She left it wide open <laughs> and I had to give myself, as you say, permission to then invent. And uh, I tried to follow the advice of one of my great mentors, Miss Ethel J. Banks. She was one of my great teachers as an undergraduate in Richmond, Virginia. And she was an elderly woman in her late 70s, I think, when I met her, still teaching, and uh, teaching very small children. And she said to me, always use the L-O-L-R. I said, what is that? She said, line of least resistance. Find out what they love. Find out where they live and who they really are. And then build curriculum to that. And build curriculum around that. And I never forgot that because she said, if I can find their passion, is what she was suggesting, that they would be more engaged, more excited to be involved. And so that's the first thing I did when I got that first teaching assignment in a middle school, an urban uh, inner city school for minority gifted and cha uh, talented students. Uh, the question was, what do they love? And I didn't have time to ask each one individually, but as a collective, in 1978, 77, 78, uh, board games were all the rage. They loved board games. So I thought, well, I'll use that. And that's what they love. I'll build a curriculum that way. So I thought, let's take all the problems, problem solving. Let's take all the problems on this continent of Africa, every one of them we could find, put them all down and ask the students to solve them all, just challenge them outright. Way over complex. But that became uh, a hallmark of the World Peace Game that we uh, have immense complexity. We don't shy away from it. We plunge students into intense complexity uh, with the understanding that they will be able to rise to that challenge. You um, present yourself very humbly um, and you really encourage your students to come forward. You have these enormously high, I don't even want to say expectations, John, but, but you plunge them into complexity that I think I've heard you say uh, adults would struggle to solve yes. through. Yeah, yeah, we have a hard time. And, you know, it's, it's really not humility, Ted. It's, um, I'd like to think I'm that way, but what it really is is just I finally uh, understood how to embrace the facts or the truth or the reality of the situation, which is I don't know everything. And I'm an authority figure in the front of the room, but I understand that collectively the wisdom in the room is greater than mine. So actually I've, I've been called to admit it openly. So it's really not... Humility is simply an admission of the truth in reality, embracing the facts of what, what uh, actually is there. And so that, that is kind of the way we operate is I have to say what is so as far as I can perceive it. And the students, I think, appreciate that. Uh, yeah, I'm not trying to be something uh, beyond and above them. You know, I, I place myself hopefully on the same level and we can work together. But uh, the idea that the complexity is overwhelming was the first hurdle I had overcome. I had asked myself, am I doing too much or is this too much of a challenge for children? And I had come from a place where knowledge was thought to be better in bite-sized chunks and watered down and made simple for children, childlike minds. But uh, we underestimated them. We really underestimated them. That's an untapped resource of immense power and value in children's uh, imagination and knowledge and ability. So I, I went the other way and just said, let's just plunge them into it. Let's call it a, a high diving board. And it's uh, such a high diving board that we're almost frightened. But it's a beautiful diving board. It's so gorgeous and attractive. They have to go up and they have to dive off. That's <laughs> the analogy we use. I love it. I've been swimming along with them saying, come on in, the water's fine. And uh, I think they, they overcome their fear of failure, 
uh, and of not getting it right and just come on in. And it turns out that their solutions, you know, have attracted the attention of the United Nations, uh, the film, the World Peace, World Peace and Other Fourth Grade Achievements, a documentary about the game and myself is screened at the United Nations. And it's been uh, shown at the Pentagon a number of times. My students have been to the Pentagon to talk with generals and policy people about how they solve problems. We had policy discussions with two, three, and four-star generals for hours about <laughs> how to do this work. And my nine-year-old students were up to the challenge. They were ready for the challenge. We got a call uh, from them. Uh, Beth Flores, our contact there, said, we'd like to ask if you could bring your students to play the World Peace game to visit with us, and we'd like to talk to them about how they do what they do. So that was an astounding thing. We, they promised us a mock press conference, uh, a tour of the Pentagon, and pizza with the generals. <laughs> so we snapped that up. And it was an amazing experience to see a nine-year-old sitting with a Marine Corps general talking about insurgencies in the field and how they handled it. That kind of thing. Just an amazing thing. And then uh, uh, afternoon, that afternoon, we were suddenly ushered into the office of Defense Secretary Leon Panetta himself. And there he was with his coat and tie, and he took off his coat. And he says, I've got 10 minutes. He ended up staying about a half an hour with the students talking about policy. He said, what's the toughest problem you handle in the World Peace Game? And they all said, climate change, global warming. He said, we have that problem, too. Here's what we do. What do you do to solve it? And they had a 20-minute policy discussion with the defense secretary in his office. John, when, when you see your students solving problems through the World Peace Game, um, what's... What grabs your attention the most about, about what they're able to do or how they're able to go about the process? I think, Ted, it's, it's their uh, relentless dedication to making sure everybody's all right. Uh, we have a number of minority groups and tribal groups and ethnic groups in our game in large countries, small countries, poor and wealthy. And without failure, year after year, game session after game session, there's always, if not one not at least one student, usually more, there's always a number of students who make sure everybody's asset value has improved or every group is safe. Uh, I don't teach that. I don't preach that. I'd like to think that they would behave that way. But the game structure is designed to defeat that impulse, really. It's designed to offer them the worst alternatives and to tempt them to take those alternatives, really. It's designed to offer them warfare as an easy, quick, and cheap solution, so it appears. And uh, they eventually come to the wisdom that those uh, alluring temptations of impulsive violence are not the smartest thing to do. Uh, they might go through that for a while until they realize it doesn't work. And I don't have to teach it or I don't have to preach it and set it up. So I think that that amazing dedication to compassion is something that just grabs me every time I see it happen. It happens repeatedly with every group I work with. No matter who they are, no matter what, where they come from, there is a fiction they must buy. And, of course, the objectives of the game are that uh, everyone's asset value must increase and all problems have to be solved. But there's a saboteur there who's trying to undermine everything. And there's some individuals who are playing to their strengths of, of deception and, and causing trouble. And even so, they still, as a group, come out with this uh, unanimous support for compassion. So that's what really, really excites me every time I see it happen. Have you ever had a, a group, John, either yours or maybe someone else who's been playing the World Peace game, fail in the game? Well, the, the game is designed for them to fail massively at first. And so initially there is complete failure always. I mean, designed it that way, really, Ted. It's, it's, the idea is that they will have to go to the bottom and come up from there. Hmm. And so there's almost a... a uh, a rhythm to the game. There's despair at first. It's complete uh, chaos and everything breaks down and nothing works. Mm -hmm. And so they move up from that trial and error, getting some things right, some things falling back and failing again. And eventually they learn of their own accord. They discover the principle of collaboration. You know, I need you to help me do this. I can't do this alone. And they start to develop a hyper collaboration, which moves into another realm and, and eventually it becomes almost synergistic. And then there's this click or this moment when they all just merge into one mind, it appears, and they can solve problems just instantly like this, all kinds of problems. They get so good at it, they want to prolong the game, they want more crises. Can you give us some more crises, Mr. Hunter? We need some more problems. Or they'll create some just to prolong the game, to keep it going, because they're at a stage of mastery where they're enjoying being able to be confident in solving problems. So that's happened for 34 years. Uh, and strangely enough, 
They've always done it. Even uh, the game has been won in the last minute. It's been won with 10 seconds left on a clock once. Uh, there was a group once in the summer I had to call the game. It was a very long, summer-long program. And the problem was I didn't know the students. You know, I spoke earlier about the relationship being critical. Hmm. And without that, I'm, I'm uh, dead in the water, so to speak. I can't really do uh, the best I can for them. You, you, you've had a lot of students over the years. You, you've taken a lot of risks in, in, in turning these challenges over to them. And it sounds like they've responded. Do you hmm. think... Do you think any child is capable of being developed as a leader? That they can be the Brennan in the moment? Huh. Well, Ted, honestly, you know, I have to be honest, I, I have no idea. But uh, I'd like to think so, but I really don't know. I, I, I do find that um, their resources far exceed what I uh, usually expect. And that given the opportunity to really uh, take full responsibility, they show me much more than I ever dreamed possible. And this kind of risk that I take, it truly is a risk. And every time I walk into the classroom, I, I'm taking this risk of admitting that I don't know and allowing shared power and shared control and admitting that things will go places I'm not fully aware of, uh, I'm not fully um, cognizant of where they're going to go. And to be in that state of openness to the moment and that state of trusting uh, of the students and the relationship we have, it's it's a gamble every day. But it's it's a beautiful place to be because it has no content. It's an empty place, but a place full of potential. And when things go not the way I want them to go, I realize that there are many layers to that. And often the students will do things I just don't agree with. I think are wrong. I wish they wouldn't. You know, I, I would teach them differently if I were teaching directly. But nine times out of ten, ninety-nine times out of a hundred. They proved me wrong. They proved that they were doing something on a wiser and deeper level than I could have imagined had I tried to directly teach something. And that's what's so awe-inspiring, that my limitations as a human being can get in the way of the learning they can do, so I've continually got to do uh, self-reflection and to be able to walk into that empty space with as, as little baggage as I can bring of my own to get in their way. So that is a risk I take every day, and, and I think that's a, a great way to be a teacher and to learn. But it, it calls, it's a challenge. It calls for you to stand up and to enter that unknown and to learn to be comfortable working and living in that unknown every day. Do, do, you, do you have to hold yourself back? I mean, how did you cultivate that discipline? To... <laughs> All the time. I'm going, do that. No, stop, stop. I, I really do. And, you know, it's my ego. It's, it's my thinking that I know best or I know what's going on or I really understand what's happening here. I have some experience and I've, I've seen a number of things I can sort of give you an idea what might be happening. But it's always beyond my limited perception. I've understood my perception is always clouded by memory, experience, habit, tradition, all kinds of things are in the way. So I'm never getting a true, true picture of exactly what the actual uh, moment is. So even though I, I think I know, uh, experience has taught me to wait a little longer, just give it a little space and see how far will they take it before it's revealed what it is. And that being able to allow a student to take a risk themselves, that's a risk I'm taking to allow them to take a risk and go up to the edge of a cliff almost. And you're a teacher, you, you want to keep them safe. You're not going to allow them to plunge into an unsafe place, but you want them to have enough space to go up to the edge and take a look and then decide what they're going to do about that. And if I preempt that by saying, here's the right thing to do, this is the right way, don't even bother about going over there, then I'm cutting off the deeper learning that could occur. Hmm. So I think that's how we like to have it happen, that open space where we can try and possibly fail, but we're in a safe place in our classrooms. You know, we practice for life. We want to practice failing now. Hmm. So when it happens in life, it's not a surprise. It's not a trauma. It's not a bad thing. It's just guessing and then adjusting guessing and then adjusting over and over again until we get the results we'd like to have. Do you have a source that, it ha that has inspired you in terms of developing into this teacher who you are today? Was it, was it previous teachers you had or um, what inspires you? Uh, <clears throat> absolutely. The, f the first thing, the very first inspiration, of course, would be uh, my teachers. And for some reason, I, I seem to think I had fantastic teachers. 
that every teacher, even the ones I considered uh, oppositional or contra <laughs> contrarian, <clears throat> every one of those teachers was great for me in some way. Sometimes it didn't come out until years later. So I, I consider that I've had the best teachers. I've had outstanding teachers. Nice. Tell all my students, please go somewhere else. <laughs> please leave home. <laughs> It broadens you so much to see how other people see things and to, just to have a different perspective and to see as many different perspectives as we can rather than to be locked into one that we happen to be born into. And so I encourage them to go other places and that's been great for me. Last question oh. is, is that I, I've asked a lot of questions so I just want to open the space. Is there, is there anything that you feel moved to say, would like to say to the teachers who are going to be seeing this video? Oh gosh, <laughs> well, you know, my cardinal rule is never to give advice, I never do, <laughs> so I can't do that. Um, I would say that, I can say that what has benefited me as a teacher, if it's of any use to you at all, is uh, somehow I was encouraged um, by my teachers to spend a lot of time, or spend an, an initial amount of time doing a lot of self-introspection, a lot of self-examination to see what my inhibitions, my restrictions, my baggage, my prejudices, my biases, see what all that is in myself first and then try and work on, on removing that because it gets in the way of other people understanding, gets in the way of children, gets in the way of my own perception about what's happening. To make a clear decision based upon my perception, you know, I've got to have a clearer view of things. And so that uh, one step has helped so much in my teaching and of course for myself, honoring and respecting and, and remembering and using the lessons <laughs> for my teachers. I mean, there, everybody w was a, a great help to me in the beginning. And, you know, when I say teachers, I don't just mean formal uh, classroom teachers. I mean, in a school building, you know, it takes so many people to make a school successful. The secretaries, the cooks, the bus drivers, the school nurses, the counselors, the TAs, teacher assistants, uh, the custodians. All those people are essential to the running of a school, and we might overlook them sometimes, not realizing they're an essential part of our success and an essential part of the children's success, too, really. I mean, without them, you know, try to teach a school without those people. Try to run a school without that, and it's impossible. So I think uh, just to express gratitude, you know, I'm feeling continual gratitude to all those people who make my life possible in every instance. So I, I really can't offer any advice, but I just say that that's what I've been reminded of, or I'm reminded of all the time in my teaching every day, really. That is such a broad support network. We're all interdependent. And the thing I can do is really just examine myself and try to become clearer and more sincere and more grateful, really, for everything that they do for us. Well, it, it's, my, it's my chance to express gratitude to you again. It's um, what a joy to spend right. spend time with you and, and hear your stories and your experiences and enter your world a little bit and um, be really nurtured and nourished by it. So thank you so much, John. Ted, thank you too. It's been great. It's a great chance to talk with you. Thank you so much.